this is a crash course on QM. Um, all of you have done it, but many of you don't remember a lot of the useful stuff that you learned. And in the articles that you read, in, in many of the articles, there is some quantitative analysis. And when you do social science research, it's important to be able to understand what those numbers mean. So we're going to look at how you can make sense of those numbers with a quick review of QM. So do you recall the two main branches of statistics? One of them is called descriptive, the other one is inferential. So in descriptive, we talk about things like the measures of central tendency, median, mode, and mean, right? So the mean is the same as the average. And this is a Greek letter. This is a Greek M called mu for the population mean and the X bar is for the sample, right? So we have the population versus sample. Or we talk about measures of dispersion like standard deviation or variance. And the variance is just the square of standard deviation. So how spread out the data is. Or the percentiles and quartiles, so the measures of precision. And we have range and interquartile range. So all of these are about the shape of the data. What is the distribution? So is it like a bell curve? Is it a normal curve? Or is it like bimodal, for instance? Inferential is a little bit more advanced. So we talked about regressions, like those lines, lines of best fit. Or estimations, like confidence intervals and margins of error, or hypothesis testing, all right? So this is, yeah, it's kind of like fortune telling. It's kind of like predicting the future. You're inferring things. In this course, in IS, I would expect from you some inferential statistics, okay? So descriptive would be a little bit um, not enough. It's too simple. I want something a little bit more advanced, and we're going to look at those. When you have a regression line, the main format of that line is y equals mx plus b, where y is your dependent variable and x is your independent variable, and you're trying to predict the value of y based on the values of x, right? The m would be your slope term, and the b would be your intercept, okay? So the slope could be positive or negative. And that's how you can tell whether it's positive correlation or negative correlation. And it can be strong or weak correlation, or it could be no relationship at all, right? So the, the data that you see in some of your articles talk about whether there is any relationship or not, okay? So we would, sometimes we would be able to deduce causality between Y and X, between the two variables. So we should be able to kind of read which one is the cause, which one is the effect in any given situation, yeah? And that's, uh, that's a funny um, cartoon. Wow, that was cool. Another thing you can use in your article, in your paper, is the empirical rule. The empirical rule also has another name, which is the rule of 68, 95, 99.7. Does that ring a bell? Yeah, you had, you had a shape like this. Usually it's well colored, where you have a bell curve and you can predict approximate amounts of data under each section. So the interpretation is we can predict that about 68% of the population would be between the lower bound, the lower bound would be here, and the upper bound, which would be here. So about 68%, as long as you know the mean and the standard deviation, the mean is the mu in the middle, and the standard deviation is the number of jumps that you have, um, you can predict um, how much of the data approximately is in that section. And then you have 95% and 99.7% for two standard deviations and three standard deviation. Now, if you, when, whenever you have mean and standard deviation, you can make a simple prediction like that. So you, you look at your articles, whenever they, they're reporting mean and standard deviation, that's one thing you can do. One thing that's kind of important here is the assumption that you must have a normal distribution, usually with large sample sizes, uh, we can assume that uh, based on the central limit theory, um, but uh, you, you need to specify that. So whenever you use this rule, you have to specify your assumption. Another option that you have is estimation, which has to do with confidence intervals. So here's a simple representation. You have a variable that you want to measure, that you want to predict, but you don't know what it is. You don't know the reality. The reality is the population. Remember, you don't really have access to the population. 
you have access only to the sample. So what you do is you go and measure the sample and you observe that X bar, which is your sample mean. Now, where is the population? Is it exactly the same as the sample? No, you don't know, maybe not. It, it might be a little bit off, right? And that's how you get the idea of margin of error. So what you do is you make jumps with margin of error. So plus and minus from each side. Within that bracket, it's very likely that the, the actual value, the population is gonna be within that bracket. So the interpretation of the confidence interval is that the population value is between x bar plus and minus the margin of error c percent of the time c here is the confidence level this is always given in your articles it's usually 95 percent or sometimes 99 percent um, so what what it, you, you could say more or less that we can be sure 95 percent of the time that if we repeat this study um, the the actual value the population value is going to be within this range okay so the population value is, is more or less the same as the truth, okay? Here we are trying to estimate the, the population mean using the sample mean, all right? So hopefully that doesn't turn out to be your uh, profit margin. Wow, that was scary. All right, so hypothesis testing, this is probably the most useful of all of them. All of you have articles where you can use hypothesis testing. So this is probably the most applicable one. And you can do a very neat quantitative analysis based on this. So the first thing you need to know is that there are two types of hypotheses. One of them is null hypothesis or H0. And the null is basically the default. It talks about the status quo. The format of the null, the main theme or message of the null is that there has been no change, that there is no impact, that there is no difference, okay? And now we have these three different terms. These are based on the context. Sometimes it makes sense to talk about no change. Sometimes it makes sense to talk about no impact and sometimes no difference. So take note of all of them. The other one is the alternate or alternative hypothesis. And there are two symbols for it, H1 or HA. You might have seen either. Um, the alternative hy hypothesis is your claim or your thesis, okay? So this is what you wanna say. Here is a simple example. Let's say your thesis is um, racial profiling in the U.S. has increased after Obama's presidency. If that's your thesis, then the null would be that nope, it has not increased. There is no difference between the time of Obama and after him. Okay, there has been no change. That would be the null. The alternate would be your claim that no, it has actually increased. Okay, now the way you would tell what is the test result is based on this p-value, which is the probability of random error. So the p-value tells us how likely is it that our observations are random error, okay? So if you get a low p-value, let's say less than 0.01 or 0.05, you can also express these as percentages, 1% or 5%, then that means significant data result. This word is very important, okay? Whenever you see significant in your articles, pay attention because that might be what you're looking for. Significant, is exactly the same as reject the null. So if you see that in your articles, you can equate them. That might be a very good way of finding what you want, okay? At the alpha level, alpha or the fish is, this is also a Greek letter, Greek A. This is a very small number. Usually it's the same as 0.01 or 0.05, and sometimes even smaller. So if you want, in, in very crude terms, you could say that a low p-value is what you want because that proves your point, okay? So otherwise you would fail to reject the null. So those are the two possible test results. You either reject the null or you fail to reject the null. And I, I wanna kind of emphasize this because the terminology that we use in the statistics is either reject or fail to reject. We don't use confirm, we don't use accept. So don't use positive terminology. This is, there is some philosophy behind it. I don't know if your QM teacher covered this. I cannot do it as a bonus. Um, but the, the language that you would use is either reject or fail to reject. Now, something relevant here is also the two types of errors. So type one error is a false positive, and type two error is a false negative, okay? So false positive would be um, based on your default assumption. So the default assumption is that there's, there's no symptoms, there's no disorder, there's no guilt. So the, the person in the court is innocent unless proven guilty. Type one error is if, you, if, if someone's actually innocent, but you execute them. That would be common error. 
If someone has no symptoms, they have no disorder, but you think that they do have the disorder. Um, type 2 error is the opposite. If someone's actually guilty, but you set them free, you don't detect it. You fail to detect some real change, which could be like a crime or a disease. Okay. If you want a case of pregnancy, it's kind of like type 1 error is, is like you have a man and, and you detect that he's pregnant. Uh, type 2 error is someone who is pregnant and you think that she's not. Okay, but the default is the default is that the person is not pregnant unless proven so, right? So those are the two types of error that you can have. This is also something that you can talk about in your papers. So here's something very, very useful for all of you that you should do right now. Pause for a moment and write down your own null and alternate hypothesis. All of you have at least one, and most of you have more null and alternate hypothesis. Based on the number of aspects that you have, usually each aspect means one hypothesis. So for each of your aspects, you can talk about no change or some change. Okay, so the change could be increase or decrease or whatever it is. And then for the second aspect, you can also talk about the same thing. So based for each of your aspects, write one null hypothesis and one alternate hypothesis. If you want to do your uh, quantitative analysis section of your article, you can simply start by that. Just write the null write the alternate and write a short paragraph underneath where you explain what is the test result based on the data that you found with proper citation.